Welcome to A Fine Time, The Nanny Revisited. This is a podcast about the nanny, where we recap each episode and then discuss, sharing our own unique take on each episode. I'm Bernadette. And I'm Debbie. Today, we're talking about episode 38, Canasta Masta. Uh, As usual, we'll start our show with a brief summary. Disappointed that Brighton is spending his free time parked in front of the television watching a Gilligan's Island marathon, Maxwell wants him to join a team sport. Fran takes him to the batting cages where he is injured when making contact with the ball. Turns out he actually has a knack for canasta and joins Grandma Yetta's team, filling the spot vacated by Gert, who had moved to a mother-daughter condo purchased by her daughter in Florida. Fran breaks the news to Maxwell as gently as she can, but he is to put it nicely, less than enthused. Begrudgingly, Maxwell agrees to let Brighton play in the upcoming tournament in Atlantic City, only to find out that Fran has actually been kicked off the team to make a spot for Gert, who has returned from Florida after an alligator encounter. Maxwell convinces Fran to go with the rest of the family, except for Niles, to the tournament. Fran is still angry, refusing to join the team, even if her mother came to her on her hands and knees and begged. Brighton, being a real mensch, quit the team because playing meant more to Fran than it did to him. And Fran only agrees to rejoin the team upon Fran, um, upon Yetta's simple request. Meanwhile, back at the Sheffield home, Cece walks in to interrupt Niles enjoying the empty house, catching him dancing and pantsless. Bernadette, is there anything you want to add? <laughs> no, I think we're good. Awesome. Would you like to take us to scene one? Yes, so we open up in the living room and Brighton is watching Gilligan's Island while Niles is kind of in the background uh, cleaning and Brighton inquires, you know, why, you know, how many times have they almost left if not for Gilligan? Why don't they just kill him off? And Niles states, well, you know, uh, well, and he, I'll back up, Brighton calls him a useless pest, right? Correct. Yes. And Niles is like, well, he may be a useless pest, but that's, you know, not cause to kill him. And then, of course, Cece walks in, hello, hello. And then, of course, and then Niles adds, of course, that's not written in stone. Right. Um, so Maxwell walks in as well and notices that Brighton's watching Gilligan's Island. And um, Fran, though, meanwhile, is coming in from the back and and Maxwell asks, why is he still watching Gilligan's Island? Oh, it's a marathon. <laughs> right. We're waiting to see uh, when they change the theme song. And apparently at one point, the theme song just had an all the rest or all the others instead of the professor and Marianne. Right. Um, and, uh, and again, Maxwell's like, well, why is, you know, he just in front of the TV, why can't he play some type of team sport? You know, like, do you have any interest? Oh, just as an owner, says Brighton. He, he's right. not really interested in any kind of team sport. And he's a smart, he's a smart aleck as usual. Yes. And, you know, Maxwell's talking about, well, when I was his age, I was captain of water polo. By this point, I think Brighton's walked away and he's telling this to Fran and Fran's like, like, you swim with horses? Uh-huh. <laughs> Water polo. It's like, oh, you better watch out if they lift up their back legs or something. Their but, tail. What do you do yeah. if they lift their tails? Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> and of course, Maxwell doesn't even deign to correct her. You know, like, and and Niles is like, uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, or shall I surprise you, sir? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but Fran offers, you know, she's going to go to Queens. She can take Brighton to the batting cages because, you know, there's always guys at the batting cages. And, uh, you know, she used to always go there as well. She always and, has fun. Yes. <laughs> and Max was like, oh, you played baseball? And she kind of has that look on her face like, oh, yeah. She sure. did not play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and she notes that he kind of wishes um, – you know, she leaves to go and he's talking to Niles and he's like, well, I wish Brighton would like what I liked. Um, oh, sorry. He's talking to Fran and Fran's like, you can't make a kid like what you like. You know, my mom always tried to take me to ballet and, um, Maxwell's like, oh, well your mother ballet, like, what did that, what was that like? 
And Fran's like, imagine the hippos in Fantasia. Mm. Not a great comment. Nope. But again, we've kind of set up in this opening scene, just again, this whole um, theme we'll see throughout this episode about Maxwell wanting Brighton to be participating. And specifically, we find out like a manly sport. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And and yeah, Fran's going to try to help with that, but... (laughs) Would best laid plans. Add? Yeah. Do I do not. Okay. So then take us to Sylvia's kitchen. So uh, as I would start to say, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Um, Fran walks into the kitchen without Brighton and she's explaining what happened. So much for sports. Brighton got hit with the ball. And Sylvia's like, oh, those batting cages are just so dangerous. You could put an eye out. Fran's like, he wishes. At which point Brighton comes in clutching around his groin which is clearly where he made contact with the ball. Mm -hmm. Yetta is sitting at the table holding the cards and she doesn't even look up and says, you want grandma to kiss the boo-boo? Like she doesn't see where he's injured. She doesn't, which is why, which is why the line is funny. But, you know, Fran says, isn't enough. I got one kid in therapy. And so they basically send him on his way to go watch the Gilligan marathon with, with Morty. And Fran warns him, you know, if it looks like he's wearing lipstick, it's just the pistachio nuts. And before he's allowed to go, Sylvia, you know, warns Morty that the boy's coming in, do up your pants. Um, and so with Brighton off, uh, they start talking about the Canasta tournament in Atlantic City. And Fran is so excited to go with the caveat that she refuses to room with Gert, you know, because it's one thing to think you're Madonna. It's a whole other thing to wear your depends on the outside which mm-hmm. fair um <laughs> sylvia and, and yet basically sylvia breaks the news to her that we're not going to the tournament we're out of the tournament because gert moved you know her, her youngest bottom mother daughter condo in florida and friends like why i mean how nice and so so Yetta tries to like help them find a fourth because you need four people to play on a cast team and She's like, I'll look in my phone book. Maybe I can find someone. And as she's digging for her phone book, she comes up with the idea of Tessie Fink. Oh, she's good. And the response is, she's dead. She is? I just saw her in Temple. Didn't you think it odd that you were sitting in a chair and she was lying in a box? Oh, says Geta. I thought they got that for her back. Well, at this point, right, I mean, what a, what a crazy thought. At this point, basically, Brighton comes in and he's explaining that Morty's nauseous. He wants the leftover Chinese food to settle his stomach. Needless to say, that's not an option. Um, Sylvia shouts to him, you know, it's been in there a week. Do you want to end up in intensive care? Apparently, Sylvia had eaten it for breakfast. And Fran explains to Brighton what that means, that she doesn't even bother to warm it up. She sticks her fork in, pulls off the container, off the carton, and eats it like a giant Chinese dove bar which is an interesting way to eat Chinese food. I'm just going to throw that out there. Mm-hmm. But so Brighton sat down at the table and they just sort of humoring him. Yetta says something like, you know, see if you can keep up. I have a tendency to play fast. Meanwhile, Brighton's just like finished his hand and he's already out. And, you know, uh, Sylvia's like, he must be one of those special people that has a knack. What are they called? And Yetta, not realizing like how obnoxious her comment is, says, idiots and it's like no no savants yet a cousin marty was an idiot and sylvia's like well although he could look up into the sky and tell you which pigeon was gonna poop on him and friends like yeah but did he move no and so they they all sort of seem to be coming to this realization that maybe brighton should be the fourth on their team so they can go to atlantic city and yet a we think is about to say what they're all thinking she's like are you thinking what i'm thinking and they're like, yeah, I just literally what I just said. And yeah, I was like, no, I shouldn't eat stuffed cabbage this close to a pilot light. Mm-hmm. So needless to say, her um, digestive system was providing uh, some nox- noxious fumes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to the scene? Nope. <laughs> you got it. So we then are in the Sheffield living room. Brighton and Fran are coming back and Brighton's asking if she, you know, the next time if he needs to bring knishes or low sodium bun cakes. Bun cakes. Yes. Those are good. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Niles is, 
is there and so is Maggie. Um, and Fran goes up to Niles and is like, Niles, like, you know, hypothetically, if you had an only son and he was wanting to join your grandma, you know, like my like, grandmother's canasta team. My grandmother's canasta team. Like, how would you <laughs> react? <laughs> And immediately Niles was like, oh, <laughs> I've got to be in there for this. And Maggie also was like, oh, I want to be there too. And Niles immediately is like, what's your cover? You know, I can be, I, you know, I can I say can I'm dusting. dusting. And he's, she's like, oh, I can just pretend I'm there for a book. And he's like, oh, you're such an amateur. Um, you know, and Fran <laughs> agrees that the office is for heavy hitters so right. maggie is not cut out <laughs> to uh to be present when fran breaks the news to maxwell mm-hmm. that brighton is joining this canasta team uh do you have anything to add to that scene um just just two things uh first when they come in you're right brighton's asking like what he needs to bring to practice but fran says why don't you let me tell your father the good news he's just yeah. gonna die I might be right behind him. <laughs> yep. And then yep. uh, for to Maggie, Fran also promises that the next time I'm giving, uh, the next time I give your father coronary in the kitchen, you'll be the first one I call. Mm-hmm. But like next time, next time you can see, you can see the, the magic happen. Mm-hmm. So um, then we go into the office and it's before Fran and Niles get there. It's just Maxwell and Cece, and Cece's basically saying to Maxwell that, you know, I think Niles has it in for me. You know, I don't want to sound paranoid, but I think he has it in for me. And Maxwell basically brushes this aside and is like, oh, it's just his way. He doesn't mean you any harm. I'm sure it's all in your head. At which point, Niles opens the door very widely and you hear a clunk. And then we see that Cece's clearly been hit in the head by the door. Yeah. Um, and so Fran and Niles come in and Maxwell wants to know how his boy did uh, at the batting cages. And Fran's like, well, he made contact with the ball, which is true. Um, and she adds, he'll have a great career if the Bee Gees ever get back together. Mm-hmm. And like, she tries to like sort of change the subject because she notices Cece kind of lying there on the couch. And she's like, would you look at her in the middle of the day? I wish I could sleep like that. And Cece's like, mm-hmm. Miles, Cece is like, Maxwell, Niles hit me in the head oh stop mm-hmm. picking on the man he's all the way over here and <laughs> and niles it, with puts on this fake innocent look she never lets up sir mm-hmm. and then he he turns to, maxwell turns to niles and says do you need to speak with me as well and he's like can't the butler just come in and say hi so clearly maxwell is suspicious and so you know fran has to basically explain what happened and she says you know baseball didn't exactly work out for brighton but he did find a game that he's very excited about see i told you there'd be an alternative to television so come on what's the game soccer hockey you need to fill me in so i know what equipment to buy and fran gets that one of those like iconic looks on her face and she's just like well maybe a nice teflon bunt pan would come in handy and Mm -hmm. slowly realization hits maxwell and you know it comes out that she's telling him that Brighton's join. He says, you're not telling me Brighton's joining your mother's canasta team. No, it's Yetta's team. As if that makes a difference. Yeah. Um, I wanted him to play a manly sport, toughen him up a little. And Fran's like, well, some of the teams have men, I think at a certain age, the hormones go. So it's anybody's guess really. And then he starts saying, oh, well then next you're going to tell me there's a, a uniform. She's like, yes, very tough masculine pink bowling uniforms with the name on it. And he's like, oh, it's going to be something awful like flushing Queens. Meanwhile, she had been like rubbing his so- shoulders, trying to calm him down. And as soon as he says flushing Queens, she lifts her hands and he's like, oh my God, you mean that's it? Um, and needless to say, this is, this is not how the conversation he wanted this is not the conversation he was hoping to have and this conversation did not go as he intended um he, at one point he snaps at niles if you're going to pretend you're dusting there at least put a bloody cloth in your hand and like mm-hmm. he he does not want to let brighton play he's like you mean brighton's gonna wear a pink bowling uniform that says brighton on the front and flushing queen on the back and she's like no his will say gert oh I'll, I'll take care of that and before the before the tournament in atlantic city he's like you max was like you can't imagine i'm really gonna let him go 
And then Cece weighs in, you know, if the child has a knack, I was good at hunting, but mummy said I excelled at trapping. And Niles draws the appropriate conclusion. Oh, take good care of your teeth, sir. You might need to gnaw off a leg someday. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a little bit more discussion, but Maxwell is, bottom line, Maxwell is not thrilled with this. Um, yeah. Does not approve. Yeah. Um, Cause like at the end of that scene, I, uh, yeah, something that's <laughs> basically Fran's trying to convince Maxwell still. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I have that cousin raised by two grandmothers and he turned out super manly. He has that big black mustache and he wears those leather chaps. Oh, and she rushes out. <laughs> So. yeah that that's not super no and I will note like throughout the scene like I think we've seen it in another episode and you at that episode said that this would recur where like Maxwell's chasing her around the office mm-hmm. and like she hides behind Niles at one point um right like Maxwell's like angry he's like are, he says are you insane <laughs> to her um so yeah yeah I, that's right before Maxwell says to Niles if you're, prote- you're gonna pretend to dust you might as well have a bloody cloth in your hand mm-hmm. yeah and then Niles immediately tries to use his sleeve yeah to, like wipe <laughs> was it the phone or the lamp in front of it him? was the lamp yeah Yep. So suffice it to say, Maxwell is not too happy uh, about the turn of the events here. No, not at all. Um, Would you like to take us back to Sylvia's kitchen? Yeah. So we're back at Sylvia's kitchen and um, Fran, Sylvia, Yetta, and Brighton are playing. Um, But uh, Fran notes that, ma, these these cards are sticking together. Uh, Sylvia takes the card that, you know, Fran has licks it yep <laughs> and says oh this is like a little bit of crystal light oh now i'm in the mood for some sweets and friends like here try the queen of hearts it, it seems it might have some smuckers on it right um and it turns out yetta has been marking the cards as she's like currently doing <laughs> not very like um inconspicuously by the way i mean she's no. pretty conspicuous and sylvia's like Ma, you've been cheating all these years and we still lose. <laughs> right. Um, and so they, I think she does like that little hitting kind of thing, like Ma. Slapping, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then Brighton says something, I, I didn't quite catch it, but basically at the same time, Yetta, Sylvia, and Fran do the little slapping thing to him um and then they know he's part of the family now right um and then um there's kind of in the conversation we get to this point where sylvia sends brighton out of the room to give marty a banana um morty 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 yes a banana because obviously there's something she wants to say not in front of him right so just before that Fran says that she's super excited about Atlantic City and starts raving about Brighton's safari jacket yes and you know and there's a look between Yoyetta and Sylvia there's a shift kind of in this uh they send Brighton out with the and Fran tells him if it looks like he's wearing rouge it's just the barbecue potato chips right um and after Brighton's out of the room, Sylvia says to Fran, well, Gert came back from Florida. Uh, apparently, th- there was an incident with a gator. Um, it was not an inflatable one. And suffice to say, there were 80 stitches that Correct. needed to happen. And, you know, and Fran's like, you don't, th- how can, you know, if she think that she can just waltz back in here to be on the team you know, we're not going to break um, a little boy's heart, you know, because Fran's under the ins- assumption that it's going to be Brighton who gets kicked off the team. Right. And if Sylvia's like, Franny, you're such a pretty girl. 
Mm -hmm. And of course, that is to mean that it's not Brighton who's getting kicked off the team. It is Fran. Correct. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, The one note I'll I'll say is that Yetta is the one who tells the story about finding an alligator in a pool and Mm -hmm. the 80 stitches. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, So then we go into the kitchen in the Sheffield home and Niles is standing where he usually does by the sink and Cece's there and she's on the phone and she's explaining to the person on the phone that I'm having lunch with Betsy and, you know, just wait till she sees me. I look like a million bucks. Meanwhile, as she's having this conversation, Niles has tied, is it a whisk? I wasn't quite sure what piece of kitchen yeah, equipment. First it looked, it has, I thought it had like kind of a handle. I thought it was like scissors or something, but yeah, it's something that has a handle because he's able to slip it through to tie the knot, like a handle portion. Yeah. See, I, for some reason it looked to me like it was a whisk and he like tied it around the whisk end, but whatever, it's some piece of kitchen equipment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Cece hangs up the phone and she walks away. And of course, Niles has done this while her very long scarf that's behind her back was resting on the counter. And as she, as she's like walking out saying goodbye on the phone, she knows, feels something hit her leg and she like looks behind her, doesn't see anything and just keeps going. Mm-hmm. Um, so she leaves and then Maxwell comes in and says to Niles that Yetta called Brighton showed up for practice without all his equipment. He was missing the Lipton soup mix and non-fat sour cream and Niles kind of gives him a look and he's like don't look at me like that Niles I wanted Brighton to be involved in something a little more virile and Niles hits him right where he lives by saying like musical theater at least your father was supportive of that and Max was like Niles don't you remember he he refused to come to my first production sound of music I saved that when I was just 17 and all because I wouldn't do what he wanted me to oh shut up Niles book me a sweet and Atlantic City. And so Niles says he's already done it. He has rooms booked for the family. He can't wait to hit the slots. And then Maxwell ruins his plans by saying, Well, with Miss Fine in the tournament, you'll have to take care of the children. And Niles is like, Oh, that sounds like fun. Achoo! Oh dear. I think I'm coming down with something. It's and then he like starts pretend coughing. It's it's getting worse. Can't go. Damn. <laughs> it's like a very soft damn <laughs> yeah and it's like high pitched and totally fake um, oh yeah so I think that's the point at which uh, Brighton comes in I think Bran walks in too um, and Brighton greets Niles by saying ugh Niles do you have any seltzer I had too much pickled herring and it's all right here and he's like gesturing to his chest mm-hmm. and he he leaves and you know, um, Maxwell basically tells Fran she won, that he's going to let Brighton follow his dream. And of course, by this point, Fran has had a total change in tune since she's been kicked off the team. What dream? Playing cards with a bunch of old ladies? I think it's sick. And Maxwell's like, oh no, I can feel the capillaries tightening in the base of my skull. And like, basically, he, it comes down to what happened. And so she, she finally caves and says, they threw me off the team. And it's not fair. They were my friends first. And she's like super mm-hmm. nasally, super whiny. And like Max, a child. <laughs> like a child. Exactly. It's so juvenile. And Max was like, so you mean my son is on the team and you're not? And friend's like, yeah. And she like her face is all contorted. Um, and so she, she basically starts doing the same like petulant child routine of like, I don't want to go. I'm not going. And he's like, well, we've already made reservations for the whole family. And she's like, no, saltwater coffee. No, your own suite with lots of little shampoos. No, ringside seats to Steve and Edie. Just cocktail or dinner show. And he's like, ah, there we go. And so, like, he sort of has bribed her into going. Yeah. And at that point, though, he's, like, hugging her. He is. Um, what When he's, like, offering the little bribes <laughs> to, to get her there. Mm-hmm. Um. I just want to add that after Brighton makes that comment about needing a seltzer because he has had too much pickled herring. And again, he's like kind of adopted kind of the voice of an older person when he's talking, you know, like an boy, old Jewish you know. man. Yes, exactly. And, and you see 
Max will start to like bristle or he's about to say something and Brighton or not Brighton, Niall starts singing Edelweiss, you know, exactly because like of the sound of music. And that's when he's like, all right, Miss Fine, you won. I'm going to let him follow his dreams. Right. Um, would you like to take us to Atlantic City? Yes. So we're at Atlantic City and Fran is at the slot machine. Maggie's next to her, um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) since maggie is not 21 but anyway um they're at the slot machines and um at that moment you know fran puts it in and she wins and she's like oh you know i always said you have to stick with the same machine oh it looks like there's at least 20 bucks here and and maggie notes but you put in 75 and she's like oh no that was from the savings from the winnings from the slot over there that i put 100 in (laughs) so you know highlighting the classic thing that happens at casinos where you end up putting in a lot and maybe getting back a little right um and we learn that gracie is actually at casino camp yep and she's playing um uh kitty crap yep (laughs) and um and i and maggie meanwhile is about to go for some tennis lessons and Fran doesn't understand this, all this running back and forth, back and forth. And then Maggie points out, oh, that's the instructor. And a really, you know, nice looking guy walks by mm-hmm. and she's like, Whoo, and she follows him. And then Fran kind of is like, now I get it. Exactly. <laughs> uh-huh. And then uh, Brighton, you know, goes up to Fran and says, um, she hope you know he he hopes that she's not mad at him and she's like oh honey you know i'm not mad at you um now my mother on the other hand (laughs) and i don't know the reference i couldn't quite catch the name zz top oh zz top okay because i thought she said cc and i was like that makes no sense zz top you know like i'll never she'll have even if she looks like zz top i'll never pull a chin hair for her again and Sylvia is like, Franny, you know, I just did it for the team survival. You know, it's not, you know, basically trying to say it's not personal or anything. Right. Like that. And Fran's like, well, I, I never want to crash in the Andes with you. And she, and, uh, and Sylvia's like, oh, well, I'd eat you last. And Fran's like, not if there, I was the only kosher corpse. Right. Which we'll talk about later yeah yep um but yeah so at that moment you know they she walks away she walks over to there's a sign for that you know whenever mr sheffield in the previous scene was kind of bribing fran he mentioned the ringside seats to steve and edie and so we see a sign that says sold out and there's two people in front of it and fran makes the comment oh hope you had your tickets because they're sold out Mm -hmm. they turn around and of course the audience recognizes this is steve and edie because their faces are on the poster too right right brand me is like oh you look familiar didn't you teach at ps 165 and (laughs) edie's like no and she's he's like ah you guys look familiar and like what do you do like oh we sing oh you must be the person <laughs> right you know with the li- right lighting makeup you know you could pass she's talking to Edie but then to the man she's like no I, I, you I don't know and and so he starts singing and then she and so Steve starts singing and Edie joins in and then Fran's like no 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 you gotta put more shoulder into it right And then, you know, like, you need to look at him more adoringly, you know. And so they do it again. And, you know, Fran's into it with them. And then she, after they're done, not bad, but you guys need to work on your chemistry. Um, And Steve and Edie walk away with them kind of, like, bickering. Like, Steve's like to Edie, see, you have to look at me more adoringly. (laughs) People are starting to notice. Yes, exactly. And, um, and Fran just kind of goes so sad. 
people living in such a dream world. Because again, she still has not realized that she was talking to the actual Steve and Edie. Correct. Uh, do you have anything to add? No, I don't. Um, okay. Take us to the buffet. So as Bernadette said, we're now at the buffet. And um, I don't remember who makes the comment, but someone's like, can you believe this whole buffet is free? And I think Fran explains, you know, if you count if you count your losses, it only comes out to forty nine dollars a shrimp. Um, and Gracie adds, "Yeah, eat up. I lost my shirt today in kitty craps." And so, like, then Fran notices what Maggie is doing. She's putting salad, a salad, on her plate, and she says, "What are you doing?" And Maggie's like, "What? I love green bean salad." And Fran's like, "What is this? Your first buffet? Skip the salads and go directly to the shellfish." And so she then, they, she basically pushes Maggie over and then she, Fran picks up a shrimp and she looks at it a, pretty adoringly and says, this will be, you know, nice markings, nice whatever. This will be delicious later. And so then we, you know, go over to the table and Brighton is in his uh, Flushing Queen uniform. And he says, is it warm in here or is it just me? I'm schwitzing. And Fran's concerned. What's wrong, honey? And he's like, oh, you better make up with your mother. I think I'm going through the change. The whole room's got it. Like, he doesn't even know what that means, clearly. And mm-hmm. Fran's like, don't worry, B. I'm sure Flintstones makes a chewable estrogen. And Brighton, Brighton, you know, says to her that, you know, playing means more to you than it means to me. Plus, I already told him I quit. And Max was like, oh, that was very nice of you, Brighton. You know, good, good job, whatever. And Brighton's like, well, well, I learned from the best. And Max was like, well, I wouldn't. He's like, not you, Dad Gilligan. Mm-hmm. And Fran's like, oh, that's the episode where the Howells adopt Gilligan, but he pretended to sleepwalk because the skipper was lonely. And so Maxwell basically asks Fran, like, oh, are you gonna, are you gonna play? Oh, I think before this, he asks, uh, is your, where's your mother? Is she too nervous to eat? And Fran's like, please, she had a snack during her hysterectomy. Mm-hmm. But but Fran basically says, you know, she could come here. She could come here on her hands and knees and I wouldn't go. And then in walks Yetta. Franny, you're in. Okay. And mm-hmm. she like gets up, takes the, the jack and starts walking away. What? Was that my mother? Mm-hmm. No, it wasn't. So do you want to add anything? No. No. Um, there is then kind of a voiceover from Fran, I think. Um, I didn't catch the specific thing, but basically, oh, poor Niles or whatever. You know, he's poor back Niles, the- home alone like a dog. Or something yep. Like that. And then, of course, we get to, um, we have a scene of the living room at the Sheffield home. And it's a new, like, angle, kind of, because we're looking more towards the, the door mm-hmm. than we are usually. And we hear the music start. <laughs> um. Yep, old time rock and roll. And in comes Niles, risky business style. Um, You know, no pants on, socks up, you know, just a shirt, sunglasses. And he starts singing along and and dancing with his feather duster. Mm -hmm. And in the background, Cece walks in through the front door and she gets this look on her face. Like she is very amused and she doesn't announce herself. She just kind of walks forward a little. Meanwhile, Niles is just dancing away, lip syncing with his feather duster. Yep. And at one point he finally turns around, sees, oh, she's there. She, he turns off the music. They look at each other. And then Niles says, you realize now, of course, I'm going to have to kill you. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the scene. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? No. You did a great job on that that scene. Thanks. So then do you want to do the little credits? Sure. Um, so we're back in Sylvia's kitchen and, you know, they're again playing Canasta and it's Yetta and uh, Fran and Sylvia. But then their new fourth, like they're happy they found a new fourth. It's Steve and Edie. Mm-hmm. Um, and Yetta makes a comment about how, you know, uh, Gert was missing a chunk from the alligator bite, which was a huge turnoff. And so Steve and Edie are like holding the cards together and they play a card. 
And the comment is, that's the card you're playing. And then all of the fines just hit, slap them like they had done to Brighton before. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Do you want to add anything? Nope. That's the episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there any, are there any larger picture points you want to talk about before we jump into our shticks? Well, so I didn't know what your thoughts were of Brighton giving up his place. I, I, I think, it, go ahead. Sorry. No, I asked you. So go ahead. I think it was a really sweet thing for him to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's again, one of those moments where we're seeing that how much he values Fran, how much he loves her. Um, it's a selfless thing he's doing. I, I do find it amusing that he, his explanation is he caught the change, which mm-hmm. he would never have. Um, if, for those who are confused, they're talking about menopause. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just to put a fine, finer point on it, uh, Brighton will never go through menopause. Um, it's just like a kind hearted thing he did. And he was also trying to like mend the fences between Fran and her mother. Mm-hmm. what did you so, think of it so it's sweet on brighton's end but also i thought it was like a little sad just because he's acting more grown up in the situation than mm. the others are you know mm. um it's interesting that throughout it's like as you were describing the scene like fran put on a tantrum like a child um, she did yeah and so on one hand, again, sweet of Brighton to do that. But I was a little sad for him just because it seemed like he had finally found something he enjoyed. And was good at. And was good at. And, and yeah, so I was, it was bittersweet. No, that, that's a good point. Um, but on the other hand, there's also some, there is something kind of weird about him being on the team and that they cast Fran, Fran off because she is their actual family yeah yeah so anyway i just wanted to check in with you on that particular no, point I, I, i'm i'm glad i'm glad you did um yeah do you want to jump into favorite fashion then mm-hmm. i'll let you start so i don't really have a good description but it's like kind of later on brand has an outfit Can is it I the personally is it the one in the kitchen when she gets kicked off the team is that where it's like orange and yellow and yes but not with the pink shirt yes so she's wearing a yellow skirt and then a black form-fitting vest over a patterned floral shirt uh that has some yellow and orange and pink and i think green and it has a frilly um neckline like a the blouse spills over the vest it's long sleeve and then she's wearing black tights go ahead yeah and so again i'm not typically a fan of like orange and yellow but i thought it looked nice on her i love that outfit Mm -hmm. so and i liked it like so earlier she kind of wore something similar but there's like this bright pink shirt with it Mm -hmm. and so it looked nice when her jacket was over it but i was not a fan of the combo with the pink shirt oh i also love that outfit i think this is one of my favorite episodes fashion wise because of those two outfits um the second outfit that you just described we first see it in the first scene it's uh she's wearing i think again black tights and then she has a black pink yellow plaid skirt and then she's wearing a hot pink like satiny silky shirt with a black tie and over that is a yellow vest it then has a matching jacket with uh fake fur cuffs that she wears later on Mm -hmm. i love both these outfits so there you go and again they they have similarities to them Mm -hmm. i would say but yeah so i preferred the the first one we we discussed did you have any other kind of fashion you wanted to discuss outside of those two outfits those are the two I wrote down, um, but I will mention Cece's, what Cece was wearing when Cece described herself as looking like a million bucks. She's wearing, uh, you know, long sleeve black shirt, 
long black skirt and then she had a very long red um scarf that was tied around her neck and then basically went down to like her um her cap her her calves right her shins like pretty far down yeah so yeah and the the gag with that too is that like she feels something there but she looks and it moves away from her as she turns so she's never gonna see it exactly of all of Niall's uh tricks that one is very hard to to catch Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah. that's the fashion uh go ahead notable New Yorkers there didn't seem to be as many this week not not as many because I feel like, again, the reference that kept coming up throughout the episode was Gilligan's Island. Mm-hmm. So there are various references to the characters and some of the specific episodes. Um, but, like, they kept referencing that throughout. Right. And then, of course, Steve and Edie multiple times mm-hmm. as well. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you want to explain who Steve and Edie sure. are? Sure. Um, so they were a pop vocal duet. Uh, made up of Steve Lawrence and E. Gourmet, who they began working together on Tonight, starring Steve Allen in 1954, and they continued uh, touring together until 2009, when one of them uh, stopped touring due to health reasons. Mm-hmm. I believe Edie passed away in 2013. That's all according mm-hmm. to our friends at Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then so another reference is to Fantasia by. Um... Fran mentions that and that's a Disney movie I don't know which decade like it's an older one I want to say it's like 1940s probably they're about it's yeah um according to Wikipedia it is a 1940 film okay yeah so Um, very old older than us yes (laughs) and um they also mentioned Psycho the movie and Janet Lee, the that main actress, um, mm-hmm. who's also, I believe, isn't she Jamie Lee Curtis's mother? I do not know that. I think maybe, unless I'm mixing it up. I might be mixing it up. But anyway, Psycho is the classic. Uh, they, you know, it has the classic shower scene <laughs> where Wait. person gets stabbed. Yeah. Do, do you know what they used for blood? Um. Was it like chocolate or something? It's Hershey's syrup, I believe. Yeah, because it was black and white, so like mm-hmm. you didn't have to worry about the uh, the color. Correct. As long as dark and moves slowly like blood. Mm-hmm. We did a tour of Universal Studios when I was much younger, and that is the one fact I took away from it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Serves me well. Uh, mm-hmm. They reference the Bee Gees. Yep. Uh, uh, go ahead. Well, was, isn't it the the Gibbs brothers? Uh, and the, they were really their height was, I think, like the 1970s with disco stuff. Yeah, they were popular in the 1960s as well. Before that, they sang in a three part tight harmony. Mm-hmm. And obviously, one of the most well known songs by them is "Staying Alive." Right. Um, you, le- cor- you learn that when you learn CPR too. Oh, fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, I knew that beforehand, but oftentimes you hear that reference. Although I think they might say that might be a bit dated at this point in terms of the uh, beats, but. Interesting. I'm not a doctor, so (laughs) I will not be giving you advice on CPR. Go take a CPR certification class if you would like to learn more. Exactly. Uh, ZZ Top. Mm -hmm. Um, They are an American rock band from Texas. They're known for their humorous lyrics and the physical appearance of two of their original band members, which was actually the reference that Fran was making. Um, And I quote from Wikipedia uh, that they were rarely seen without their long beards, sunglasses, and hats. If anyone needs an image, I recommend Googling ZZ Top and you'll understand why Fran telling Brighton that she her mother could look like ZZ Top before she plucks another chin hair and you'll get the joke. Mm-hmm. So 
Yeah. Um, they also mentioned Jenny Craig, which is a weight loss system. Yep. And then we also have obviously the sound of music, which we learn is the first show that um, Maxwell put on at age of 17. And along with that is the song Edelweiss. Edelweiss. Yep. And let's see here. We already talked about Stephen Eady. Mm -hmm. While you're looking, uh, there's a reference to Madonna, who we've talked about previously. Mm -hmm. um, the song Old Time Rock and Roll was... And then... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. It uh, was written by Thomas E. Jones III, George Jackson, and Bob Seger. And I quote from our friends at Wikipedia, a sentimental look back at the music of the original rock and roll era. It was mm -hmm. featured in the film Risky Business. Mm -hmm. And that is the parody that Niles is doing. Niles comment, if you realize now, you realize, of course, now I'm going to have to kill you. Um, I tried to figure out where that came from. And I stumbled upon an article on the webpage tvtropes.org. Mm -hmm. And they said that basically it used to be used in like espionage and security, but now it's more often used tongue in cheek, mm -hmm. um, which is exactly how it was used here. Yeah. And then uh, there's also the reference to just the Flintstones to avoid this. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. Do you have anything else for no notable New Yorkers? I do not. I think that's all of them. See, this week there weren't as many as there usually yeah. are. Yeah, I agree. So on to Yiddish Akap. So stuff. There, there is stuff. Um, so I guess I want to start with uh, just something in the background. Um, in the kitchen, in Sylvia's kitchen, we see a menorah, which is kind of interesting because I feel like every time we're in the Fines home, there's a menorah of some kind visible. Like mm -hmm. last week, there was one in the storage unit. Uh, the first time we were in their living room, I think I pointed it out. There was one on their mantel place, but now here's another one in their kitchen. Um, but what's particularly interesting about the one in their kitchen is it only has seven, like, branches. Uh -oh. And Seven. so instead of nine. No, oh, sorry, nine. Yeah. So basically when you look at, and I'm going to explain the difference, a menorah basically means chandelier. So it basically is any number of them. Traditionally, it's seven. So you have three on one side, three on the other side, and then the one in the middle. So that's how you get to seven. When you're talking about Hanukkah, that is a, a menorah that is going to actually have nine. So it's going to be four on one side, four on the other, and then the shamash, the, the helper candle. Oh, okay. The technical name for a menorah used for Hanukkah is actually a Hanukkiah, not a menorah. But everyone uses the term menorah because that's what people are more... I guess more comfortable pronouncing and how it's used usually normally in like pop culture. So mm -hmm. I thought that would be an interesting thing to share. I'm glad you found it interesting. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, I feel like I've previously talked about Jews and Chinese food, so I don't need to cover that again. Um, knishes are, um, I've had knishes. I can picture knish, but it's very hard to communicate what they are. So I'm going to borrow from our friends at Wikipedia is a traditional Ashkenazi Jewish snack food consisting of a filling covered with dough, typically baked or sometimes deep fried. Um, apparently, according again to Wikipedia, you can purchase them from street vendors in urban areas with large Jewish populations, kind of like a hot dog stand, but not. So traditionally, knish is going to be filled um, with often like mashed potatoes and fried onions or cheese or other types of fillings and they can be very very yummy um so i highly recommend them uh brighton commented that he was schwitzing mm -hmm. that means he was sweating um mm -hmm. and then you know sylvia promises fran that she would eat her. i promise i'd eat you glass darling well not if i was the only kosher corpse i find that an odd thing for fran to say considering the family is constantly eating shrimp as Fran does in this episode, which is, again, not kosher. Um, I will also throw out that humans are not kosher. Um, <laughs> just in case anyone was curious, humans are, again, not 
I'm going to underwear, underline the, the word, not again, not kosher. Um, uh, yeah, the reason we know that they are not kosher is because humans are land mammals. We do not chew our cuds and we do not have cloven hooves. Therefore, humans are not kosher. Mm -hmm. um, um, go ahead. That brings me, that reminds me, I've missed out on a reference. Go for it. The Andes never crashed in the Andes with you. I beat you last. Um, that is all a reference to a real life situation. I think it was like, what, the 1970s or something? Like uh, a plane did crash in the in, in the Andes mountains and um, do the, like the weather and various things, like the survivors of that plane crash were out there for like 70 something days and they had to resort to eating um, the dead to survive. Oh, so I, I didn't, that's, it's like, yeah, that's a reference to like an actual, um, situation. Yes. And like, I think like a soccer team was like on it. Rugby team. As you were oh, talking, I Googled. Mm -hmm. Was it the seventies or was it October 13th, 1972? Okay. Yeah. So that was an actual thing that they had to resort to eating the dead. Yeah. Um, according to this article on history.com, when it, Uruguayan rugby team crashed in the Andes on October 13th, 1972. Cannibalism helped some survive two months in harsh conditions. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, of the 45 people on board, most of them were in their late teens or early 20s. Um, they were traveling to play an exhibition match in Chile. Um, let's see. They, the plane hit a second air pocket, dropped some more, and then fell beneath the cloud cover the passengers could see a mountain face 10 to 20 feet away and then apparently they crashed some of them blacked out when they woke up about two days had passed um this is actually really fascinating and also mm -hmm. absolutely terrifying um yeah i i watched um a couple of months ago like a youtube video about it that's how i knew that was like a real thing that had happened yeah um they th apparently this article goes into how they ate the dead which is a little mm -hmm. bit disturbing well, I, will I believe they specify like they they specifically like had only a couple of people be the ones who quote unquote prepared it and they were trying to like so that the others wouldn't know who it came from or whatever. And I think they were trying to be respectful of the dead as well when they were doing it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like a very extreme kind of situation. I would say so. Yeah. Cause I mean, it was snow everywhere and in, in a remote area. So mm -hmm. anyway, sorry, that was a, a brief aside, but, but that reminded me that is a reference. Thank you. Um, that's, a disturbing reference yes <laughs> yeah um, um yeah was there any other yiddish that i i, I well, skipped over pointing out just the obvious that we've pointed out before again fran admiring the shrimp <laughs> yep not nah, shrimp is not like, kosher and encouraging maggie to skip the salad and go for the shellfish correct shellfish is all not kosher the only uh fish that is kosher is the fish that has uh Fins and scales. Mm -hmm. So anything else is not considered fit for consumption. As uh, one of my friends once put it, when you think about shrimp and other crustaceans like that, they're basically sea bugs and land bugs are not kosher either. So it sort of makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. Are we ready to move on to 90s nostalgia? Absolutely. Would you like to start? Yeah. Um, so. Again, um, I think like how they're talking about certain things, again, like Maxwell's focus on it being manly and virile and how, you know, Fran talks about her cousin and that kind of stuff feels a bit dated. Um, mm -hmm. Not that there's not some people still with that kind of mentality today, but I feel like in general, that's right. more dated at this mm -hmm. point 
I agree. Yeah. How about you? I'm going to start with old cars. <laughs> yeah, we see a lot of old cars. Mark that on your bingo card. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if this is dated or just like location based, but like excitement about going to Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did, did you have any any others? Yeah. So it, what's interesting is, you know, at the beginning when they're watching Gilligan's Island and um, Max was like, why are you still watching it? And Fran's like, it's a marathon. <laughs> well, again, like back then, like that's the only way you could really, if whenever the show was on TV. <laughs> is when that's a good it. point. Um, and I remember I watched Gilligan's Island as a kid as well. Um, now they still do like for on syndication, you know, like on like TBS and all this other kind of thing that they still do kind of like numerous episodes at once um, sometimes. But I mean, I remember as a kid, certain older shows, they would have marathons on specific, you know, specific times. So you would just sit in front of the TV and watch it. It's not like you could stream it. <laughs> right. That's an excellent point. Of course, now any day can be a marathon, assuming you have mm -hmm. access to the right streaming service. Exactly. Yeah. Um, CC's the phone CC's using when she's talking about her lunch with Betsy. Um, kind of how different. It, I mean, I I kind of felt like the the casino looked a little dated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Kitty craps. I. Also, I'm not sure places <laughs> that would, would be encouraged. Exactly. Well, that does make me go back to the whole fact that Maggie was there with Fran. Like, was there a, a change? Am I, like, thinking wrong that you're supposed to be 21 if you're, like, actively in there? So, like, I think, I think that, like, she wasn't actively in there. Like, she wasn't the one playing. Like, she was standing slightly behind Fran. Like, I think, mm -hmm. like, you could walk through. You just couldn't, like, play. Mm -hmm. I think. It's been a long time. I, I've never taken someone, a child, to a casino. So I don't know <laughs> what the rules are. I, I, I went to Atlantic City when I was a, a kid. Um, I, I, rem I think I remember walking through. Obviously, I did not play. Um, I tried to prevent my parents from playing I think mm -hmm. they gambled all of like $20 because I was very anti-gambling at the time mm -hmm. um yeah that's a long time ago yeah um do you have any other 90s nostalgia or shall we jump to future fun let's jump to future fun uh so I'm gonna start where we just left off uh Niles has a gambling problem and we'll see just how bad it is when Maxwell takes the family back to Atlantic City trying to woo Chevy Chase into starring in his new show. Um, I believe that's season five. Might be season four, but it, it's a bit later in the series. Um, later in season two, actually in the episode, I believe a fine family friendship, Brighton, Maggie, and Maxwell all play on a baseball team together. So, and Fran makes a comment, Brighton's playing sports, I accept tips. Um, and then the last one, you know, kind of as Fran says to Maggie in this episode, she doesn't understand why people watch, why, why people play tennis, it's a sport she doesn't get. And of course, Maggie points out the attractive tennis instructor, and so she gets it. Um, later in the series, Fran learns to play tennis, Brighton teaches her, and then she plays a beginner's tennis match with Maxwell and Maxwell's thinking he's gonna uh beat her and it's gonna be great it'll help him feel better after he got really bad reviews on his latest show and she actually beats him which prompts a midlife crisis on his part wow that's in the, the episode that's midlife mm -hmm. so yeah cool. those are some things for us to look forward to mm-hmm so more uh, sports in the future. There are more sports. Correct. Correct. Um, I guess it's time to rate the episode. Yes. 
And it's my turn. I love it when it's your turn. I know you do. Makes me happy. Um, I think I'll just give it like a four. Okay. Um, wasn't my favorite. There were some things I was like, eh, about. But again, it, there were um, good moments with it. Again, I'm a little bittersweet on, like, I, I agree with you. It's sweet of Brighton to, like, do that for Fran. Mm-hmm. But also, I was a little sad for him, too. <laughs> So. No, that that's fair. Yeah. How about you? I'm giving it a five. This is this is one of my favorite episodes, um, in large part because I really like the fashion. Um, I, you're you're right. There are some things that are problematic, but I, I just have a different relationship with this with the series. So like, it's hard to, it's hard at times to criticize um, something that you've known your entire adult life I guess um and like or even going back to your childhood where you would where things you didn't recognize things were problematic I guess Mm -hmm. um I I overall I like the storyline I like that Maxwell relents and Brighton gets Brighton is going to play I like that he's you know a sweetheart and you know arranges for Fran to play and make nice with her mom and grandma um I love the conversation with with Yetta I love the you know her suggestion of the person who just died not realizing that she had died um the the whole alligator story the frightened being part of the family the constant jokes about Morty and <laughs> the different colorations on his face from the different food he's eaten um yeah so I'm giving it a five and I'm gonna stick with it you do you <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Anything else you wanted to um, talk about before we wrapped up this week? I don't have anything else. Do you? I do not. All right. Well, that's all we have for you today. We hope you had a fine time with us as we revisited the, na- the nanny. Join us next week when we'll be discussing episode 39, The Will. If you would like to reach us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Nanny Revisited. You can also send us email at a fine time nanny revisited at gmail.com. Have a great week.